<laughs> yeah, shit, how are we going to follow that? <laughs> Excellent. Well done. Thank you so much, everybody, for making such an interesting day. It's a hard act to follow. It is. Thank it's God really... Cornelia is here with me. <laughs> Thank so God, Oliver what, is. <laughs> why don't you start, Cornelia? Um, I actually bought a present uh, for you, a broad one. <laughs> and it's a little work of art. Oh, here. See, it's oh. a diamond. It's kind of a, like a big diamond. <laughs> and, um, and it just struck me now that you, uh, we heard the word infrastructure. Try to, uh, there's a button on it there. Try to press it. So I'll tell you what it is, Cornelia. It's the sun nice. as I harvested it in Berlin on Monday. Wow. Solar panel on the back. So a little bit of a solar panel. And I call it a work of art because when I show it to people, they say, what is this? And then I say, it's a work of art. And then they say, oh, <laughs> it's... And at some point, I said to an elderly woman at a market in south of Addis Ababa, I said, it's a work of art. And she said, no, <laughs> no. Do you mean like in the church? And actually, that was not what I meant, because I, I'm into infrastructure, and, and I was like, this is obviously about having access to energy. But then I said, yeah, well, yes, like in the church. And then she said, it's amazing. <laughs> and so, so we are from the culture sector, the cultural sector, right? We say it's art. We are free radicals. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's a strange time um, now, because as an artist, I was thinking, what can we possibly do in terms of the, the, the enormous problems that face us? And I think both you and I are almost like social sculptors, you know, that we spend a lot of time interacting with people who are not artists um, and making our work in all kinds of ways. I mean, in talking about new materials and um, the idea of... I mean, I was very interested in... Um, Graphene, which is um, something that was invented about 10 years ago in Manchester, where the atom was split. I'm, I'm like an honorary professor at Manchester University, and I was doing a show there a couple of years ago. And I used my professorship and my exhibition to get to meet people in the university I was really interested in. There was two guys there who, who, who invented uh, graphene, or discovered graphene, Kostya Novoselov and Andre Geem, who are both Nobel Prize-winning physicists. And I really wanted to talk to Kostya um, about graphene, because it's made out of graphite, you know, which is in all the pencils that artists have used throughout the centuries. And he uh, was also you know, very au fait with art. So we talked together about what graphene could do, you know, what the potential of it was. And, and um, I mean, people all over the world are fighting for patents for graphene. And I'm, my biggest worry is now that we're about to, to do Brexit, that Kostya and, and uh, Andre, who were brought to Manchester mostly because they loved Man United, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, all the universities in the world were competing for them and they and went to Manchester. And apparently it's also an option for batteries, right? We yes, had the, ba yes. the battery question, the battery question, and the battery question in the phone. So gra graphene well, it, might well, it, be... Graphene, the reason I was interested in it, I suppose, uh, uh, as somebody who's been interested in green issues for a long time, was that I thought this was the holy grail, you know, that it would make batteries charge up in some milliseconds rather than hours. Um, it can be used for desalination of water. Um, it's be, on, a, on a nanotechnological level, it will solve a lot of the problems we have. And did you, and did you make a work with it? Yes, I mean, I, my, my proposal to, to cost you was, uh, could you make graphene out of... Um, an old master drawing, like say a William Blake or a constable or Turner, and his eyes lit up, and because uh, he's very interested in the history of graphite as a material, so he came with me to uh, uh, to the Whitworth, which has all these old master drawings, and uh, with the aid of the conservator, we took tiny specks of graphite. You took the, off the drawing, off, off the, the paper. drawing, because normally little specks of graphite. Oh sort of go along, you know, there's the, the three the whole, radicals. They, the whole drawing. Sometimes the uh, uh, conservators take away specks of graphite because they might smudge the drawing. So Costi was allowed to remove those, and he made... And I said, what can we make out of it? And I said, could you, you know, could you make a switch? Could you make a sensor out of it? He said, yes, you know, we can use this as an electrical charge. I said, well, what would activate it? And he said, well, the breath would do it. So on the night of my uh, open, reopening of the Whitworth, because it was been closed for two years, Costia um, breathed on a tiny piece of Blakeian graphite graphene and uh, set off this fire display which was a big fiery um, sort of Blake in abstract which had a meteorite in it and it was it was called breath of a physicist and oh. Kostya and I since then have collaborated more we've been down to the graphite mine where all this 
all the pencils in Britain and all the old master drawings would have come out of this graphite now, and we went down there together. Um, but this is, I mean, and he is, he's, uh, he, he makes, you know, he makes drawings and he makes uh, calligraphy, and he, the reason that he and, and Andre um, came up with their amazing breakthroughs is one of their night, they have play nights, they almost have a, a time on Friday where they might do workshops with all the young scientists, and they were just playing, and they're like children in a way, I think they're just like artists, and Costia thinks of himself as much artist as we do, and so I think... You know, there's a whole thing in education in Britain, what's happening is that the um, creative industries, you know, all the si uh, art is being stripped out of the curriculum um, because they think technology and science is the way to go. But without art, I don't think that would happen. No, that I whole agree. Thing. I agree. Yeah, the interdisciplinary skill. I think so, as you have been uh, just describing, the, the process of turning thinking into doing, involving scientists, asking other disciplines to, to get involved, architects, and also... Uh, for my part, so social scientists, like behavioral psychologists, on, for instance, how to change people's pattern. So with regards to, for instance, the climate, it's apparently really difficult to use data alone, like scientific data, and show it to people and then make them change their mind or change their behavior. Uh, maybe changing the mind is actually easier, but changing the behavior is even harder. And I'm curious about, when also when you talk about art in this way, that art, I believe, and culture is capable of at least contributing to the change of behavior. Because I think it offers the opportunity to, should I say, engage in a, um, not only using the head, like data, right, and also uh, sort of empowering, empowering yourself physically. And working um, on this, I once brought some Greenland glacial ice blocks to Paris during the COP22, when the Paris Agreement was being worked on, because I wanted to show what is the scientific data, what does it look like when you look at it, right? So what does the glacier look like? And with the support of uh, Bloomberg's team, actually, uh, we put all the, glac the, the glacial rocks in the city so that people, they could walk over and look at it and say, oh, it's ice. <laughs> then they put their hand on it, and then they say, oh, it's cold. And interestingly, they obviously knew that, but, but still physical knowledge and intellectual knowledge, if we call it that, are not necessarily connected. So what it allowed for was in two seconds you could understand what were the heads of states actually talking about. And if you, uh, so the book that Mike mentioned this morning, The Climate of Hope, actually has a picture of that project in it, which is another good reason uh, to, to get that book, uh, should you want to see it. I mean, not the real ice, but a picture of it, right? <laughs> but, but, but point being, the, the, the way we have worked with the studios in the interdisciplinary way, I think is very much about reaching out to people and not, I, I guess we could call it listening to them, or verbalizing on, the, on their behalf. That sounds a little condescending, but how do we say it? Activating people. And for me, that is where I, or art meets architecture and design, because it occasionally succeeds to show people a situation where they say, oh, I know this. This is how I feel. I just hadn't come around verbalizing or you know, giving it structure or language or space yet. This space, this building, this city plan is actually reflecting what I wanted to, I was about to say. <laughs> I just didn't get around to say it yet. And in that way, it is as if the shape of things is listening to people. And that, I think, is so exciting about your work, because for me, it's very much about people being given the opportunity to say, well, you know, somebody actually listened to me. I'm OK. It's very strange at the moment, because I'm in, back in England, I'm, there's a general election going on, and I've been um, appointed uh, by the House of Commons to be the election artist, which is like being a, a war artist. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, um, and it's, you know, I'm the fifth one. Um, they've only been doing yeah, You should years. follow that Instagram of yours. It's so brilliant. Um, so election artist 2007. No, tw 2017. 2017. <laughs> no, 10 oh, years behind. Yeah, 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 20, yes, oh my God. Uh, or just hashtag Cornelia Parker. But I was appointed only a month ago, and it's very strange. It's because I was talking to the House of Commons anyway about getting some of the material from the building, because they're refurbishing it. They're taking out asbestos and all kinds of things. And I was very interested in the material from the, from the you know, our seat of Parliament, because it's very charged material. Um, and I've, you know, worked with all kinds of charged material. And, and because I was, happened to be in the right place at the right time, when the snap election turned up, they said, oh, would you 
would you like to be the election artist? Um, so I, because I've, all I could think about was Brexit, Trump, you know, the fact that all the, you know, the, the, all the social services and education and housing and everything in Britain was going down, this, you know, down the, the toilet. Um, <laughs> I said, yes, I'd like to be election artist. Uh, and then they said, oh, you've got to be very un, unbiased. You know, you've got to be very apolitical. I thought, shit, <laughs> I found that very hard. Um, so uh, in my, if you look at my Instagram, it's my, I've just lost my social, virgin, social media virginity, you know, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, I've never done any social media. I'm phobic about social media. Um, so I'm doing this very short project on Instagram, so it's the least of all evils. Um, but I did, I, I must admit, it's very addictive. You know, so now me and, me and my daughter are busy Instagramming, and my husband's really furious because he, he never gets any eye contact with us. Um, but what I've, I've been sending some images from this, from this debate today. Yeah, why don't you, talking about social media, you had this idea of asking who has children what was that? Well, I was thinking an action we could all do this week. I think Mariana, um, who, who I'm collaborating with, um, is, is going to be going to China, and she's going to be chairing a panel with Rick Perry, is it, from a part of Trump's uh, government uh, in China? And I think they're just about to pull the plug on the Paris Agreement. And I thought if everybody in this room who has children or in all your address book who have children, if your children could write a little message to Trump saying, please save the planet for us, uh, I think coming from children and just begging him to, to do the right thing, uh, if millions of kids sent him images, they, he might more listen to that, I think. Than and how do you think? Because I, it's a, so obviously... tweet him, because you can go directly to I Trump. I love it. But, but so now we need to... So all the people... <laughs> Great. <laughs> so now we are within the comfort zone of these resourceful uh, people here how do we get the blue belt uh, you know was uh, the kind of um, uh, the countryside the trump voters how do we get them to do it i mean what type well, of well i think everybody has kids and everybody wants their child to have a future and i think a good 70% or 80% of americans believe that climate change is happening. So I, I, I don't know why anybody, and also they would love, you know, to a green economy to take off. We need to retool the whole world as a green economy, really. Yeah. I mean, that's where all our financial problems will be solved. It seems a no-brainer, really. That Britain, particularly, seems to be lagging behind when we've invented about 50% of the world's inventions, and yet, and we've got graphene invented in Britain, and we're not putting money into it. We're you know, nobody's talking in green. In the election, nobody's talking about climate change except for the Green Party. And it's a big disaster just about to happen. Yes. Um, I'm, just, I'm just curious, is there, a, within the cultural sector, this power to kind of also not sustain the continuing polarization between in-group, out-group, green, north, north, north and south, or, or blue and red, and so on? Because always one part of the team feels not listened to. And that's why this idea of being able to create a space in which not agreeing can also be a success criteria, which I think essentially is a, you know, a space in a museum. You walk in, I walk in, you say, oh, I love that green color, and I say, oh, I, re I really prefer the blue, and we can still be friends, right? So think about that for a second. In a parliament, that would immediately mean a huge uh, you know, argument where one team eventually will have to leave, have no access. Uh, but in America, they've got a green tea party, for example. You know, a lot of Republicans are very pro-green, um, but they say you're not, not speaking the right language. You know, you have to talk about it in these terms rather than these terms. And that it's, uh, I don't know, it's been annexed, I think, the whole, um, our future's been annexed by yes. language. So, um, so I've been reading um, about Daniel Kahneman lately, um, Think Fast and Slow, I think oh, it's yeah. called, and the Peter Lewis about the undoing project. This, the decision-making, which seems to be much to my surprise, highly irrational. And it gives, some, gives me some trust. It turns out that people are, as I said before, totally uh, oblivious to uh, you know, data, but they're much more, uh, they trust the gut feeling. And in that sense, I, I really think that the cultural sector has something to offer, asking a social scientist, asking a, a, a sort of a mathematician, a, ge a geographer, and to collaborate with regards to creating a space in which we can combine the data and the gut feeling. So I'm not trying to eliminate the fact that we actually feel uh, the world around us too, but obviously science uh, tells us about the climate. Now we need to get that narrative emotionalized, which brings me just back for a nanosecond. So what it obviously empowers is not just charting the solar panel, but it also gives me a sense of holding power in my hand, or holding hands with the sun, mm. and maybe later holding hands with you, mm. uh, dear. But essentially, <laughs> the, 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 and the idea of a diamond is obviously, essentially a diamond is a compressed bit of sunlight and so on. Bit of carbon. 
But the idea of <laughs> empowerment, I can, in fact, educate myself, which is why we have it in, in Africa primarily. I can educate myself, I can take charts, I can charts myself, right? So the, and that is, I think, the listening dimension in this, the fact that you find a narrative which allows people to express or empower themselves. You're not top-down empowering them, telling them what to do. I think you're nurturing the kind of uh, bottom-up uh, principle, which I think is what the cultural sector is particularly strong in, just like your, uh, the stitching um, project. Oh, yes. Uh, I did a project last year uh, called Magna Carta and Embroidery, which was um, a commission by the British Library and Oxford University to commemorate 800 years of the, of the Magna Carta. So what I did was take the Wikipedia page, which I spent a lot of time looking at, as we all do, and I printed, had it printed out on fabric, so it's 15 metres long, and I had it divided into pieces. It was all hand embroidery, so I took something digital, um, a digital uh, encyclopedia, had it hand embroidered by prisoners, most of, the, most of the long sentences were done by prisoners, um, and they were all ac accomplished you know, embroiderers. And then I lof, le left lots of gaps, and all those gaps were filled in by judiciary, MPs, uh, barons, human rights lawyers. Julian uh, Assange. I, uh, Julian Assange, who um, I got to embroider the word freedom in the Ecuadorian embassy. Uh, and then uh, Edward Snowden embroidered the word liberty in, um, in Russia. Um, so all these, and all the people who are not uh, prisoners were very bad at embroidery. So you've got, <laughs> um, you know, s some Lord Judge doing a really bad, you know, sort of uh, a habeas corpus. And I really like the lack of skill by all the most skilled people and, and all the beautiful embroideries done by the uh, prisoners and the embroiderers' guilds lady who did all the illustrations. But it was like thousands of hours of embroidery that went into this project and, and, and a lot of participation. Um, like Jimmy, Wales, like Jimmy Wales embroidered a uh, user's manual and Jimmy posted and made a website just for the piece. So it's like a crowdsourced work of art. But Wikipedia mm -hmm. is a crowdsourced piece of information. Yeah. So Jimmy, I think we're yeah. living in a crowdsourced world at the moment, and that could be our saving. So thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>